My name is Trevor Mokel, and welcome to the Mendocino County COVID-19 update. Today, we are pleased to be joined by Mendocino County Health Officer, Dr. Andy Corrin. Dr. Corrin will give an update to the COVID-19 status for the county. After that, we'll open it up to take a few questions from the media concerning the COVID-19 incident. We'll have, we, have, we will be limited to two questions for each media outlet in order to preserve the schedules of our staff. If time allows, we'll also take questions from the public. If you are a member of the public, please leave your question or comment in the video below, and we will do our best to address it. Now, beginning with the health update, Dr. Corrin, you have our attention. Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome to a happy Friday. A lot has happened this week, so this week's will be a little longer than usual. Before I start, I wanted to announce that the county flags are currently at half mass through Tuesday, April 20th. Um, 19 or 2021 to honor the victims of the tragic mass shooting in Indianapolis, Indiana. So for the health update, I will start again with data. As of April 15th, the United States coronavirus cases number 31,400,193, which is increasing. The deaths are also increasing with 464,098. The uh, increase is being pushed by surges in Minnesota, Michigan, New England, and the Northeast and Puerto Rico. In California, the cases are up to 3,606,882, and the deaths number 59,372. The um, REF number is 0 0.86 in California, which indicates that the spreading is decreasing. And that compares to Mendocino County, which is an REF of 0 0.78, which is uh, better than the California lower is better. In Mendocino, as of today, the average daily case rate is 3.23. Positivity rate, for our tests is 1.4%. The total number of cases that we've had here are 3,977. Uh, the Hispanic community has suffered 1,989, which is now 49.9% of the total, which is very slowly decreasing. And it's, this is the first time it's under 50%. Those in isolation now number 21. Those in quarantine are 23, and our deaths in Mendocino from COVID now number 47. Currently in the hospital in Med Surge, there are three patients, and there are none in the ICU. There are two Mendocino residents in long-term nursing facilities out of county. There are no current outbreaks, and no school cases are open. Testing now available at the Ukiah Fairgrounds every Sunday through Thursday from 9 to 5 p.m. and at Fort Bragg Veterans Hall every Tuesday from 9 to 5. The travel team is visiting today at Balala and Boonville. Uh, and then next week it's Round Valley and Willits followed by uh, Point Arena, Boonville and Laytonville, Willits uh, a month from now. Consolidated Tribal Health also continues their testing events. People being tested with symptoms should go to clinics uh, on weekdays or any weekday uh, to be tested. We have had some positives after people have been fully vaccinated. In this county, the total number is 16, which is less than 1% of the people who've been vaccinated. Uh, and this well within the expected ranges, uh, given the efficacy of the current vaccines. Mendocino County has had 66 total random tests for variants going back to July 2020. Four variants were West Coast or California variant of concern, B1427 and B1429, which has a 20% increased transmission. There were two in early January and two were reported in early February. These are not as threatening as the UK variant, B117, which is 50% more transmissible and is felt to be the reason for the current fourth wave 
on the East Coast. No more variants of concern or interest were found, but none were present in the tests done before December. Um, so we must keep vaccinating and testing and all the non-pharmacologic interventions in order to keep the spread as low as possible. We're trying to set up a county surveillance program for variants with uh, whole genome sequencing uh, through VRDL. And this would be for situational awareness. Uh, it takes a long time to report the results of these tests. So they don't have clinical significance for individual people, uh, but it is important for our county as a whole. The schools are also now testing staff and athletes regularly. Uh, from the point of view of contact investigation and contact tracing, this has slowed down with less cases, but it is just as important as earlier. We are getting some positive results after full vaccinations, but much less than expected with the numbers that we have vaccinated in Mendocino County, which is all the reason to continue testing as well as all the other measures for protection. Um, so for vaccinations, let's move on to talking about the Johnson & Johnson one-shot uh, vaccine. Since Tuesday, this vaccination has been put on pause due to reports of cerebrobasilar venous thrombosis. That's a clot in the basal artery of the brain. Uh, this is an unusual type of stroke. It is associated and probably caused by a platelet deficiency, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, that may cause a rash or easy bruising. This is at a rate of less than one case per million vaccines. We have had none in Mendocino County. This is a similar pattern seen in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine, another viral transport vaccine um, using the adenovirus. And this is distinct from the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. These problems occur at a background rate without vaccines. So one question is, are they related? Are they cause and effect? Or is this even out of the ordinary in terms of the numbers that we're seeing uh, as, as a background rate? And it's just possibly been noticed due to our vaccine reporting. The CDC, the, FA, the ACIP and the Federal Drug Administration met Wednesday to discuss and the Western States Safety Group also met, both have decided to expend, extend the pause to see if these are a significant number and look into other scientific issues. So the two issues uh, that I wanna talk about first are clinically, if a person has a severe headache, stomach or leg pain, neurologic symptoms or easy bruising within a month, of receiving a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, not the others, then uh, with those symptoms, they should seek medical evaluation at their providers or the emergency room. It is not expected that this will have an effect on the California vaccine program um, since Johnson & Johnson accounted for only 4% of our vaccines so far. Vaccine supply was set back this week but we have been assured that it will get back on track again to slowly increasing in the next couple of weeks. It's this week we have been giving a lot of first doses of Pfizer and Moderna, as well as second doses. In addition to our signed MOU for joining the TPA, and our, our partners have also signed up with Blue Shield. The county is using an improved My Turn for county events, and our partners are beginning to use it for appointments um, and scheduling as well, um, and beginning um, and beginning registration. For the patients, we expect this to be a much easier single call for checking their eligibility, finding a clinic, making an appointment, and beginning registration. This is available online and by telephone. It is in, uh, it is in both English and multiple languages. For our vaccine team, it is also easier to set up events with my turn, restricted to Mendocino County only, or target age or other groups, um, as well as easier registration and the beginning of data collection. This month is the transition month, 
so that many of the allocations that used to come through public health um, will now be going directly to our uh, partners from the state. Later, all the clinics should be getting stable allotments from uh, the TPA. There will be some flexibility of reallocating. My turn is not yet perfect, but if you need assistance, call the county or NCO Promotoris to assist making an appointment. The phone number for my turn is 833-422-4255. Or you can go online to myturn.ca.gov. The county number to get help is 707-472-2663. And for NCO, the number is 707 467 3239 or text them at 707 209 7161 with in the in the body of the text write NCO VAX. Eligibility now is everyone over 16 years old. Uh, 16 to 18 year olds are only able to get Pfizer. We have decreased the barriers of verification requiring only proof of name and an address. This is all private and secure. We will vaccinate anyone who lives or works in Mendocino County. We continue to reach out to ag and food workers, childcare, those with chronic diseases and disabilities, as well as homebound and those who are experiencing homelessness. We're starting to vaccinate those who are 16 to 18 years old and their family members partnering with the schools uh, of course, again, those under 18 year olds will have to get Pfizer. And those under 18 year olds will also have a consent that will need to be signed by uh, a uh, responsible guardian. Please remember eligibility does not mean availability. There may not, there may still be problems with supply, but sign up on my turn so you get an alert. Pfizer has also submitted an application for an emergency youth auth use authorization for 12 to 15 years old, and we hope that that will be approved over the summer. We'll continue with large events, as well as continue to work on smaller events and strike teams for smaller groups. Many of the clinics are now offering uh, appointments to get vaccines uh, at, their, at their appointments or at the events that they hold. To support all of this, we are continuing and increasing our outreach with education on social media and radio, as well as flyers, door hangers, et cetera, in English and Spanish. Vaccine data, which does not include the federal government allotments to the Indian Health Service, Veterans Affairs, or retail pharmacies. As of April 15th, over 64,000 total doses have been administered in Mendocino County. 42% of our county over 16 years old are fully vaccinated compared to California is 29%. 54% are at least partly vaccinated compared to 48% of Californians. 57% of those people in the lowest resource zip codes have been vaccinated in Mendocino compared to California's 20%. 16% of uh, our doses have gone to the Hispanic community compared to 22.4% in California. We need to do better in this area, um, but we are showing some significant improvement. And uh, it should be noted that the state is also looking at how uh, race and ethnicity is being recorded on these systems. 0.8% uh, of American Indians in uh, Mendocino County uh, has been vaccinated according to our data, and this does not include the IHS doses, compared to California is 0.3%. Our vaccine clinics next week uh, will generally uh, show a few first and second doses of Pfizer and Moderna. Of course, no Johnson & Johnson's are, will be available due to the pause. County events on, uh, on Monday at the fairgrounds uh, will be 1 to 6 p.m. Tuesday, we're doing an event with the Potter Valley School. Wednesday, with the Covalo School. 
and beginning and the beginning and this is the beginning of our project to get all of those from 16 to 18 year olds years old and their families vaccinated before graduation um, we may have to go longer depending upon the supply but that's our aim rcms has their clinic on saturdays and um, they will have uh, second dose pfizers at smaller events during the week and at their clinic visits uh, all these clinics are by appointment only. Mendocino Coast Clinic has an event on Friday, and this is the exception. It is an open clinic of Pfizer from 9.30 to 12.30. Um, Anderson Valley will have Thursdays. Uh, this week, it's second dose Moderna, and again, that's by invitation. MCHC is uh, because of the uh, pause in Johnson & Johnson is not able to have a clinic this week. Um, Adventist Health is going to have an event of second dose Pfizer, I believe it's Pfizer on April 29th in Willits. Bechtel Creek by appointment is uh, having um, Moderna first doses available. And Laytonville Tuesdays and Fridays regularly has second doses um, of Pfizer from 1 to 4 p.m. by appointment only. And uh, today, Round Valley Indian Health Center has a clinic scheduled. Our tiers, we are uh, in the orange tier for almost two weeks now. To earn the yellow tier status, we will need two weeks of a case rate less than two per 100,000, or in our case, less than uh, less than 12 cases per week. We've come close, but we're not there yet. Briefly, the highlights of the orange tier um, were reviewed last week, uh, but there are some new issues that have, uh, that have come up and um, changes that took effect on April 15th. So places of worship are open to 50%. But this is a recommendation and not a requirement due to rulings of the court. Um, there's an increase in capacity allowed for retail, including shopping centers, restaurants, museums, and movie theaters. Uh, new indoor activities include pools, wineries, breweries, distilleries, and bars which serve food. Family entertainment, car rooms, satellite wagering, and offices are also indoor, uh, are allowed indoor, uh, but we're still encouraging telework for offices. Gatherings, which are informal, uh, do not require testing or vaccination, but are limited to 50 people. And indoors, 25% availability, but strongly discouraged indoors, and no food or drink, and uh, people who are um, higher risks should also avoid these gatherings. Um, what is new at this point to notice as I go through the next uh, set of, um, of guidances is that there is now a capacity bonus to incentivize people getting vaccines and testing. Private events with tickets or a guest list uh, assigned seats outdoor are limited to 100 but 300 if all are show proof of testing or vaccination. Indoor are allowed if all are tested and vaccinated up to 150 people. Outdoor live events, which apply to sports, performances, and graduations are for in-state people only unless vaccinated. There must be a weekly worker testing program and Capacities vary from 33% up to 60% if all are showing proof of vaccination or recent testing. Indoor seated live events and performances, again, are restricted to in-state unless people are vaccinated. There must be a weekly worker testing program. The capacities are increased from 15 without and 35 if all show proof of full vaccination and recent testing. Fairs are limited to people from in the state. Weekly worker testing has to be ongoing. 
and there's a 25% capacity limit. Um, if fully vaccinated two weeks past the final dose, close contacts do not need to quarantine Travel for in-county, if fully vaccinated, there is no need, excuse me, for in the country, national travel, if fully vaccinated, there's no need to test or quarantine before or after travel unless there's symptoms. For those um, who, who want to engage in international travel, um, they will need to show proof to board or at customs uh, non-vaccinated, non-essential workers, out-of-state and international travelers must test one to three days before leaving and three to five days after re return and quarantine for seven days if the test is negative or 10 days if no test. This is, these are other reasons to get vaccinated. Extra caution is advised for people with higher risk since vaccine experience is a little too early to be sure of the duration of immunity and transmission. So in summary, we're in a good place in Mendocino with low cases, low hospitalizations, fewer positive tests. So we're opening our economy, our activities, our reunions, and we hope this will continue. But a new wave that's spreading through parts of the East and the Midwest could grow and include us with another wave or surge and the need for more closures. Variants seem to be the cause there. We've had a few here, but that could change. The way to beat them is to prevent transmission and multiplication, which is when more variants develop. We do have coming up ahead of us, times when reunions are very common and times when we can spread more. Those are graduation, Memorial Day, the 4th of July, and all of the travel that does tend to happen over the summer. We want people to be happy, but also be safe. So for gatherings and parties, keep them brief and outside if possible, without food or drink. Mask and social distancing and hand washing are still very important non-pharmacologic protective measures. Avoid out-of-state travel. It is more risk and more risk of bringing into our state variants. We should continue masking and keeping our distances increased ventilation or outdoor activities, testing and vaccinating. This is a race to vaccinate. If you haven't vaccinated, don't hesitate. If you've been holding back, ask yourself or your provider why. We now know with lots of experience that these vaccines are effective and they're safe. Uh, and you are now eligible if you're over 16 years old. So if you've been vaccinated, tell others, spread the word, the, the uh, best way to advertise is by word of mouth from people that we trust. And yourselves continue to mask, distance, avoid large gatherings, continue hand washing, and increase the ventilation inside or be outside. Don't forget to test often, even after vaccination. We'll be able to detect, detect outbreaks and potential surges um, sooner and protect the gains we've made. With that, I'll end and uh, we'll be open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Korn. Now we're gonna throw it over to the media. First up, we have Mendocino Voice. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I've been having a camera issue today. Um, so I, you know, I, I tend to ask this question a lot um, to pull out your crystal ball, but uh, what, what are, what are we looking at um, in the spring and in the summer? Um, when do you think we might see a reduction in tier? Or is the, is the danger that we're seeing from the surge back east actually something that's more acute and that we, we, um, we shouldn't get our hopes up that things are gonna be retor returning to normal soon? I think it's a great question. Um, we, we wanna continue protecting ourselves, uh, but clearly the governor, and I didn't mention this, but the governor has uh, pointed to June 15th as a time to uh, go beyond the tiers. And so get out of this very restrictive, um, you know, highly legislated in sense um, community protection. And so we think that if we can keep continue our vaccination program, 
we can keep up with that June 15th uh, time. And uh, that will not mean the end to all precautions. Masking and distancing will continue. And uh, we'll probably not want a lot of huge gatherings that are not, do not have some restrictions like that. Um, but hopefully we'll be getting more to normal toward uh, the summer and beyond. That's what I'm hoping. Thanks, Dr. Korn. Uh, my, my second question is, if, could you give us some insight into what conversations with the state around the vaccine supply actually look like? We, we get from week to week very different um, statements about how much vaccine is happening. Is that, is that an issue between the county and the state? Is that an issue between the state and the feds? Is that an issue of just pure manufacturing capacity? Can you give us some insight about how frequently are you talking to the state about this? How frequently are they telling you one thing and then delivering a different thing? Um, how you know how reliable are they in that respect? And um, and what kind of promises and how how far in the future are the promises that they're making about vaccine availability? So there is still a uh, supply issue. The manufacturers need to step up their supply and we were looking forward to a gradual increase in that supply and increasing significantly more towards the end of April in the next few weeks. Um, I think that that will go and continue with Pfizer and Moderna. We're, we're still in a wait and see week with, um, with Johnson and Johnson, uh, but the numbers of Pfizer and Moderna uh, that, are, that are expected are expected to increase. Now we don't know from week to week what we're getting because it can be restricted by the feds. They may pull more vaccines to go into places and have more mass vaccine clinics uh, where there's a surge, for example, in the East or the Midwest. And so they could pull some vaccines off the top so California doesn't get them. California can also move some vaccines to other counties if they feel like those counties or the lower HPI index um, uh, census tracts need significantly more vaccines. So it can be any or all of those. But at this point, our vaccines into Mendocino County seem to be holding pretty stable, not increasing the way we had hoped they would, uh, but they are not taking a dip like they did a few weeks ago. And so. We're, we're holding on to our seats and, and hoping that everybody can get their vaccine. You know, the nice thing about my turn is that people can register and then they can be notified when the vaccines are available. So I again, wanna encourage people to sign up for vaccinations. It is easier now and more secure uh, that you'll get vaccinated when, when we have the supply in town. Thank you, Mendocino Voice. Next up, Mendocino Action News, Danila. Hello, thanks again for having the meeting here. So my question, in regards to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I don't know if this is straight across the board to all the other states. I know that we were doing it in Mendocino County. We were giving it to more hard to reach community, the incarcerated, homeless, um, some homebound. Are these people that typically seek medical treatment and have regular doctor visits? Is this gonna be part of the research to see if you know, additional people have side effects that just don't normally go to the doctors? I don't, I have not seen anything that suggests that the complications that came from Johnson & Johnson affected uh, any subgroups more than others, except for women between the ages of 18 and 48. It is true that we had um, um, made an effort to make available to people who were hard to reach. Um, we wanted to make the Johnson Johnson more available to them because it was uh, one shot. Uh, however, remember that the immunity that's imparted by even just one shot of Pfizer or Moderna is quite high. And if, uh, if we don't get Johnson Johnson back online, we can continue to manage uh, getting into uh, people who are harder to reach and at least get them one shot and uh, and significantly protected against against the uh, the pandemic. Um, you know what we want to do is to make sure that the vaccines that we distribute are distributed equitably. At this point, um, the issue is does Johnson and Johnson really present 
an objective danger to people who are uh, who are vaccinated by that. And um, and is is that first of all does it exist? And second of all, is it significant? I mean, all of the treatments that we have are not without some danger. So there's a lot of research that has to be done at the state and federal level to see if the uh, danger that presented by Johnson Johnson is significant and should and should cause us to continue to hold off on using that. But even if we do, we should be able to, to reach all of the people that want to be reached with the Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines. Does that answer your question? Uh, pretty much, yes, thank you. Okay. So my other question is regarding Pfizer, I think I've seen something recently in the news about them talking about the possibility of a third shot. I know we've discussed this in the past. Do you have any further updates? I don't have any further updates, except I'll just fill you in. You probably already know this, but it all depends on what the experience is going forward. We don't yet, we haven't had the vaccines around long enough to know how long the immunity lasts. And we don't know what the effect of various of the variants will be and what the context will be. So if it turns out at nine months, there is a higher rate of uh, breakthroughs, then we're going to probably say, oh my gosh, you know, this uh, may need a booster at nine months or beginning at 11 or 12 months. Um, if we see a lot more variants and the variants are resistant to the vaccines, the, uh, the companies are already looking at developing vaccines that will be able to attack the uh, B117 and the, uh, and the uh, variants from South Africa and from, um, from, uh, us, um, the, uh, from Brazil. Thank you, Dana. Next, we're gonna move on to KZYX, Alicia. Hey, good afternoon. This is Alicia Bales with KZYX. Um, I, over this week on Monday, there was a vaccine clinic in Ukiah where there were several hundred doses that hadn't been scheduled. So we were on the, the air making announcements, encouraging people to go down to the fairgrounds and get their shots because there were a whole bunch available. Are Did you have any other experiences like that this week with uh, shots where people hadn't scheduled for their vaccines, or are you finding that it's harder and harder to fill those big clinics that, that you've organized? Well, I think there, there have been some difficulties filling the clinics, but as we've uh, increased the eligibility, uh, there seems to be a lot more uptake. And as time goes on, a lot of more people are uh, breaking down their hesitancy about the vaccines they held off until, you know, so-and-so was vaccinated and, and they see more people around them who've been vaccinated and uh, the, the um, you know, there's a little bit more willingness to take them. And it's a process. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move on to the... Wait, pandemic. I get one more question. Sorry, my mistake. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I had to decide which of my many questions to choose. So I wanted to definitely do the second one. Um, I wondered if you could talk with Mendocino County residents about um, what would you say to folks who want to use alternate health methods or natural methods? Are there any natural therapies that can keep people from getting COVID like uh, Chinese herbs or diet or, or, or anything like that? What would you say about uh, people who want to go that way? None of those methods have any proven efficacy, certainly masking and distancing and the hand washing and so on and so forth are effective. Uh, but the most effective way by far is to be vaccinated at this point. All right, thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to the Breast Democrat, Ethan. Uh, hi there. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the 16 breakthrough cases. Um, I want to see, were there any serious illnesses or hospitalizations within those 16 cases? Um, of the fully vaccinated cases, um, we discovered some uh, that were at Ukiah Post-Acute. Um, and, uh, and some others that were at Mountain View. And so some of them did actually shortly after their second dose uh, wind up with severe illness, yes. 
Uh, do you do you have a number available? Um, I don't for that for who had the most serious consequences. Let me just take a look at my spreadsheet here because we've just gotten that today or yesterday. So, Dr. Corin, I can assist you with that. Oh, please, thank you. Absolutely, nine of those individuals did have symptoms. Sorry, did they have one more question? Oh, uh, okay. So we don't have a number for for the severe, but you said a handful did have severe illnesses and nine had symptoms um, is what you have right now. Okay, uh, fair enough. Um, did any of those 16 people test positive for any of the, of the West Coast variants or are, and if not, are they being tested for those mutations? No, they were not, not that I know of that they had the whole genome sequencing because um, we didn't have those results in time to actually to actually send them off. It has to be done uh, while, the sim while the specimens are very fresh. And they have to be at a, at a high uh, level, um, what they call a, a CP value level. And at least one of the facilities that had some symptomatic people were sending their samples to, um, to an out-of-state lab that could not would not send us the uh, results to forward for whole genome sequencing. Okay, thank you. So we don't have any questions from the public today. So I'm gonna throw it back to the media for one more question from each uh, media outlet. So we're gonna start back at the top with Mendocino Voice. Would you like to answer one more question? Okay, hearing nothing. Mendocino Action News, Danilo, would you like to ask one more question? Sure, thank you. So Dr. Corrin, you said there was no current outbreaks or any cases related to school going back since we've reopened school, if you will, um, more recent, not the other eight schools. Has there been you know, a lot of cases related to schools opening or extracurricular activities. I know at the last meeting you said the cases were more related to the household versus getting it at the school. Is that still accurate all, all around? Yes, I, I don't think we've had any outbreaks that have actually been in a school. Um, and, uh, you know, so They've been individuals, we record them if a single case happens in the school, just as a way to collect that data, if it does turn out to be an outbreak, but we, we haven't gotten that. So we've got an individual case here and an individual case there, but nothing more than that. KZYX, Alicia. Yes, thank you. Um, I would love to hear some follow up on what you just talked about with the, the breakthrough cases. Um, you said that there were people at Mendo Post Acute and Mountain View who uh, were who did get infected after they'd been vaccinated fully. Can you talk can you talk about which vac vaccines these people had and if they were um, in these long term care facilities, Mendo Post Acute and, and Mountain View, uh, were they hospitalized after they got sick? And and again, were, were there any severe illnesses or death? Um, they happened with each of the vaccines. It was not predominantly one vaccine or another. And um, I am pretty sure that. A uh, few of them wound up in the hospital. Becky, do you remember that offhand or have the records open? How many we had that, that were hospitalized? Uh, of the individuals that were hospitalized uh, with the two week after vaccination, uh, I don't believe that we have any, uh, excuse me, I, I don't believe we have any that were hospitalized after the two weeks uh, for vaccination. Uh, the symptoms that were presented were things of cough, muscle aches, chills, fatigue, 
um, runny noses, those types of symptoms. Uh, for and I apologize, I had said nine in my spreadsheet when I counted. Uh, I had the header line, so there's eight. So I do apologize for that that correction. Uh, so there's eight there, and none of them, as I said, uh, showed that they've been hospitalized from it. Uh, and this is those individuals that are two weeks past. Okay, uh, and then we're going to move on to the press Democrat, Ethan. Um. Great. So, so yeah, just to follow up. It was each of the th of the three vaccines um, resulted in breakthrough cases, and then I, I'll just throw one more in there. Can you just kind of put this into context? I know you said it's well within the expected range, but people might be alarmed when they hear someone got reinfected after or or became infected after receiving the vaccine. So, if, could you just kind of put that into perspective of what this means? Give some context for it, and then just again to clarify um, if it was all three. Uh, vaccines that people had um, among those 16 cases? Yes. Um, so the number um, of, of breakthroughs that we've had in Mendocino County, which is two weeks after their final dose. So if it was Johnson Johnson's after one dose, but Moderna or Pfizer's after two dose, the total number of those in the county were 18. And within, and again, there was all three were were uh, were represented. Um, for with sixty four thousand doses, that is a rate of less than three per ten thousand breakthroughs. All right, and I see Mendo Voice has rejoined us. Uh, would you like to ask one more question? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I logged off after my last question. Um, yeah, I was wondering um, if you have advice for um, what people should do with their vaccine cards and what that's going to look like in the future, and if there's been any talk of formalizing that kind of verification process beyond the flimsy paper card that I carry around in my wallet. There's been talk of it, and there's talk of... Uh, using a uh, vaccine passport for travel and for entry into various different venues. Um, there are problems technically uh, in terms of doing it. Imperial County is trying to write some definitions and, and laws and they'll have to engineer an actual physical card. Uh, but the best thing that I would advise is what I advise parents of children who get their vaccines, keep it near and dear, uh, make a copy. Uh, if you need another copy of it, your primary care provider can get into the CARES network and print out not a copy of the card, but a printout of the vaccines you've had. But yeah, it's, a, it's an important thing. And we don't have a substitute that's been accepted uh, statewide or nationwide yet. A number of people are, are experimenting with that. The problem is potential fraud. There are problems with uh, equity issues that are surrounding it. And um, so there are some issues that have to be uh, circumvented and figured out before we have something better. All right, thank you, media. Uh, that sums up today's COVID-19 update. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to give Dr. Korn one more opportunity to give any concluding comments. So I'll just summarize up by saying we're in a better place than we were a few months ago, for sure. Uh, but we shouldn't get complacent. We need to protect ourselves with masking, social distancing, and the other measures that we've outlined. Uh, this is a race against the variants in some way, and uh, we don't know how long or how effective our vaccines that we have will be, but that should not be a reason uh, to avoid or put off getting the vaccinations. They are the most effective. You can see from our data that the numbers of cases have come way down, the positivity of our tests has come way down. And the uh, complications from the vaccines are very, very small, very minor compared to the protection that's given us. So, uh, so I'm gonna say again and again, keep your distance, keep the masks on, uh, the social hygiene, the testing, and get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Corrin. Our next update is scheduled for April 30th. Please continue to follow Mendocino County Public Health on Facebook for all COVID-19 updates. Thank you for joining us and hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you.